second slot for ABAP Cloud for classic ABAP developers. For us, for Volker and for me, it is very important and for, for us in the ABAP platform overall to, to have you, the classic ABAP developers, on stage, on board, sitting in the same bus, because we have a big journey in front of us, which is ABAP Cloud, using ABAP Cloud, being cloud ready and doing all that nice things, which we just learned in the keynote session of the ABAP conference. And, and um, we can only do that if we enable you to transfer your knowledge, first of all, to transform your, your, uh, your knowledge, which you have from the classic ABAP world, into this new ABAP cloud world with all the new tools and technologies, language enhancement and all that stuff. So therefore, first of all, welcome to the session. If you have any questions, please put them into the chat. And for me, we will visit the chat here for this uh, session and then uh, raise the questions and try to answer them. So the agenda is therefore quite simple. We will have a very, very short, uh, short introduction. Why our cloud? Um, that is, um, I think, part of many sessions and was also already part of the keynote session. And then, um, what is now the difference from classic ABAP compared to ABAP cloud? And uh, why is it different? Why did we do it in a different way? It's just not different that for the reason because then it's different because there are good reasons why we do things. And um, then last but not least, um, how to find and where to find more information. So why our cloud? I think everyone knows the slide now. So we are talking about the development model for apps, services, and extensions in order to build cloud-ready applications following the clean core principles. And we offer that for all deployment options. So um, yeah, today we will have a look on transaction applications, how we did that and how Volker did that in his um, um, pre-SAP time also with DynPro, and how we are going to do that with Fury based on database tables, with ABAP and CDS, with business objects. And of course, there's way more you can do with ABAP Cloud integration services. You can expose them, you can consume them. And then we will um, also have in ABAP Cloud, or we do have all the assets which we know from ABAP. But let's focus on what we're going to do talk today. So that's classic ABAP development. Um, for those um, who did not see the first session, um, um, maybe you have an option um, when you're watching online um, as, as, as a recording to do that now up front, or maybe um, if you're interested to do that later on, um, because we are explaining a lot of details um, which, which are important to know and which help a little bit to understand also the session. So, um, but first of all, Really, from a developer perspective, what's now the difference between classic ABAP and ABAP Cloud? So first of all, if you do custom ABAP development, for example, in SAP S1, Cloud, private public cloud, or even on-premise, you um, can use ABAP Cloud. And in the um, public cloud and in Steampunk, you have to use ABAP Cloud. There is no other way. Um, and um, yeah, we, we are applying here ABAP in Eclipse, ABAP development tools in Eclipse. We have an optimized, cloud-optimized, and also a little bit restricted ABAP language. We have some new keywords we have removed for the cloud-optimized version, some, some which are not cloud-ready. And of course, we are using all the assets which are set, like the uh, proven ABAP transport manager. Just um, uh, sorry for interrupting. There's uh, one uh, participant saying that they cannot hear, but others can hear as well, like I would assume. So then it's probably a local issue with that person. No, maybe, yeah, okay, yeah, thumbs up, okay, we can, sorry. Okay, no problem, no problem. Thank you, Volker. And um, so one example, um, and of course it works, this example is from, from an s 4 um, public cloud system. There is, for example, no way to access the legacy persistence tables or APIs. So for example, like doing a select from the Mara, because we say this is more like the internal thing. And if you want to talk about the cloud, you need to be cloud lifecycle stable. You need to provide stable APIs. And therefore, no direct access to such um, artifacts is uh, possible anymore, even from a syntactical point of view. Maybe you have taken care for package checks or something like that in the past, um, then you did a very good job. But um, yeah, not everywhere this is used. And, and um, I think that's it's even more common to not do it, unfortunately. But um, here we have a strict check that this is um, even from the kernel, from the other kernel, is, is, is um, um, violations uh, are supported by syntax errors. So, like the table doesn't exist. And the new way is that we have um, real clean APIs and, and cloud ready APIs like the CDSU iProduct, which is a CDSU similar to a data view, 
but in the CDS um, syntax and language written. And uh, you can access the same data via high product and you don't have stupid German abbreviations, but more international, the English terms and, and case sensitive and, and more, much more speaking names, human readable names. And this is really the basis, which is the ABAP for cloud development, the language version. So the ABAP language has different versions. We have the classic ABAP and um, or, um, I think in the tooling it's even called standard ABAP. And uh, it's not standard maybe anymore, but um, um, we have now also ABAP for cloud development. And also ABAP. I, yes. I have a, a question which is quite a long, a question which I have for a long time already. Um, is it possible to access function modules or uh, methods uh, which are customer defined in the in the classical ABAP um, or is it not possible because I I think from my perspective I think it's really necessary sometimes to do something like a call function when if there's a very deep customer specific uh, functionality or something like a call method or something uh, uh, otherwise I don't know how to uh, replicate this and it's, it's also a very, very uh, much work to replicate such methods, maybe. Yeah, thank, you, thank I mean. you for thank you, thank you for the question. But as said at the beginning, maybe please put uh, questions into the chat because we have many, many participants. So otherwise, we will end up in a, in a chaos. But thank you first of all for the question. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, yes, yes. Um, um, so question is, um, okay, how can I access my own coding? So maybe there are three things. Four things. First of all, you implement in this new ABAP language version ABAP, uh, for cloud development within ABAP Cloud. You can do that in all the different deployment options. You um, have restricted access, but maybe also from our side enriched access via new APIs to the technology APIs. So there are certain released APIs from us, from the ABAP platform side, which you can use. And there are also certain APIs from S4HANA, from the application space, which you can use which is, for example, I product if it is released. And we make sure that this is cloud lifecycle stable. Now, the question goes more to the direction, but what about my own code? And your own code, um, if it's in the same um, software layer, then you can also consume uh, your own code. So that's that's not a problem. Uh, I mean, otherwise you can't, can't program or you can't, can't even start here. But all this is uh, being part of the last um, session of the closing keynote here, Boris, and I guess uh, Boris Gephardt and, and Alex Ota, they will give an overview about how this works together and with your legacy code, with your classic code, with your existing application code, for example, in an on-premise or private cloud edition, where you are not having 100% about cloud, but where you need to integrate the things which are already there from your side, maybe even from SAP side. So thank you so much. And now, um, maybe we, here we are focusing more on on on, on the, the the core pro programming model. So how how um, is now the classic ABAP um, things um, how they are mapped into uh, the the um, new world? And I think first thing is of course we are not using WinPro anymore. We are using Fury. We can do this similar patterns that handled a little bit differently because we want to have responsive UIs. We have um, um, in memory database access. Uh, which is much faster where you don't fill out the selection screen and then you wait a little bit and then you get the result. We have this now here interactive, more interactive style as you can see um, here in this uh, corner where you have the filter bar and then the list is automatically and you do the filtering, the sorting and all that stuff immediately. The text search Shana provides and then you get the results and you can navigate to this object page, but pretty similar to the selection screen and the list. So that was um, already explained also in the first session, like also Volker has uh, showed in the first session, how we can compare the SE80 with ADT. So the principle is very similar. You have an option to open artifacts. We even don't have to really know what kind of artifact that is. Um, I think Control Shift A is the abbreviation, is the shortcut for the, the um, um, pop up here, but also that you don't have to know if you start uh, ADT for the very first time. You will see how the, the shortcut is, and it will link you or it gives you some introduction of open artifacts. You can say open the same artifacts, and of course, all new things which we do will probably, and in most cases, only be accessible via ADT because we will not afford to integrate that in SC80 as well, because ADT and maybe more is our future. And then um, that was basically the 
um, 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 tools view and the, the end user perspective. And um, in, this, in the other session from the SAP DevTober Fest 2023, um, you, you have the uh, full story here with this link. And there we provide an overview how DDIC and CDS are related to each other. In DDIC, we have a model driven approach. We didn't uh, call that, uh, call it like that uh, years ago, but also in the data dictionary, we model the database tables, we model the DDIC views on top, we model value helps on top. And this simplifies the consumption. For example, if you have a model DDIC value help, then this can be automatically rendered in a webdom for other application or in Dupro application. And we are following this approach now further with CDS. So CDS is basically um, um, an extension of DDIC in a um, source code based um, um, approach. And um, also OpenSQL got a face uh, uh, lift because it's now called um, above SQL. So it's not 100% open anymore because it's restricted to HANA because we need to make some assumptions that the database does support certain things. Otherwise we could not um, then introduce the syntax for it like the contains. For example, and therefore we are supporting with ABAP SQL only SAP HANA as a database, but therefore we provide also a lot of more features, which is not the common set of all available databases, but which is a set of features HANA provides. And then we can do also the, um, the so called query push down with optimized performance from end to end. The authority check in ABAP is still very important, but in case of a query, we don't do the select and select. But we have a DCL, a data constraint language, which is describes how the authority object is related to this database view. And this is again a modeling aspect, a model driven aspect, because every time we are using now this view, the CDS view, the DCL is considered automatically. We don't have to keep in mind to always use the same authority object everywhere where we do a select on a database table or a data view. It's connected to the CDS view and applied automatically makes our life easier this model driven way. We also have learned how select options and value helps are reflected. And here the Fury UI annotations play a major role. And there's this nice app, the Fury feature, um, Fury feature showcase app, um, where we have an overview of all available annotations. We can see a look and feel, uh, the look and feel of this um, in a Fury application, then refer to the documentation how to apply that. And we give, gave a short introduction to how the K codes in the ALB can be provided to have buttons in the ALB and how to how they are implemented in the classic way and how this is now done with wrap business objects um, in the ALB. You can even do that. Or you can do that, of course, in the future in the Fury application. <laughs> so therefore, I think uh, some questions. Maybe we do a little interruption here. Yes, that is okay with you. So um, let me try to. Uh, pick some of the questions that are stated here. So one was uh, ABAP Cloud is part of the clean core strategy to, to ensure um, our S4HANA um, system is upgrade stable. Um, but if we don't have any intention to move to public cloud, do we still need to use ABAP Cloud or can we just stick to the classic ABAP? Any question? Uh, the answer is yes, of course you can stick to the classic ABAP. However, you know that from all the release upgrades that you had in the past, um, that it was uh, in some cases maybe a little mess uh, in order to move from one from one release to the other, and, and therefore it is uh, strongly recommended that with the newer releases, um, uh, with the availability uh, availability of the um, of our cloud, that you uh, make use of the um, cloud programming language um, instead of um, sticking to the classic classic one because this ensures the upgrade stability and um, should give you significantly less headache when it comes to an upgrade. Exactly. So about cloud, that is the, the cloud aspect and the lifecycle stability aspect. But on the other hand, um, what you then build, the applications you build are much more modern, which is also visible for consumers or for end users. So if you create a classic Dream Pro application, you can do that, of course. But um, I think in the modern world, your applications are much more expected or modern web-based applications in general. And you will not benefit from all the innovations which we will bring in the future into this. So. More questions? There are, in fact, more questions. Shall we go ahead yeah, with the questions? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, there was um, the question, I guess, uh, which also was verbally mentioned by by Michael, um, um, in, in terms of calling uh, deeply um, kind of nested methods and function modules. So uh, whatever you have implemented yourself in the cloud and your own software component can be consumed right away. 
Um, if you want to um, um, work cross software component, then you can also release it for others. Um, however, what is uh, not offered by default is that you can call each and everything that SAP has uh, provided, because this is um, um, yeah, only the one or the, the artifacts and the elements that have officially been released can be consumed or, or, or yeah, can technically be consumed and should also only be consumed because this um, yes. and those this, um, things will be a kept upgrade stable. Everything else can theoretically change. I mean, you know that in the past Mara table was not kind of deleted for whatever purpose because that would be impossible. However, it could significantly change and everything that you have built based on Mara could then not work anymore. And this is why we um, focus on the um, upgrade stability here and um, um, allow customers in the cloud only to make use of things that have been released. Um, however, everything that you code uh, on your own uh, can be consumed or as I said, if you also work cost component, software component, then you can even in, if you're working in a bigger uh, um, um, uh, enterprise, then also you might uh, want to only allow um, certain interfaces to be used and not um, each and everything that you have uh, implemented to be used. And there was another question regarding writing data because we say always CDS is the way to access data, which is correct, yeah. Um, and CDS cannot be used for writing data. However, you still write into tables and they're the same story holds true. Um, SAP will never release any tables for writing. Yeah, so um, standard tables will never be um, so-called C1 release. So you cannot write directly into database tables. Therefore, up business objects, for instance, or other APIs need to be used in order to update standard things. However, your own stuff, the same holds true what I mentioned before. If, it's, if you are in the same software component, you can directly access each and everything that you've implemented because inside the software component um, that is that is automatically allowed and cost software component, if you work with different teams and you set up different components, then again, the release is uh, required, the C1 release, and then others can access your stuff. Exactly, and it's very important not to write directly into the database table because there might be a code running um, on top. And there is, of course, uh, I mean, that's a job of our um, developers at SAP, for example, to inform others that there are changes on the data and these changes won't be propagated if the code um, on top is not running. And therefore, it's very really important that we have these BOs. And we can also see from Eswana, I just um, asked my friend, Renzo Koller, he's, he's also contributing to some sessions and then blogs. You probably know him, um, his name. Um, he, I asked, just asked him how many um, APIs, uh, web business objects, and how many events, which are pretty new, do we have now in the S1 application space? And I think with the public cloud, um, which will be probably there in 2402, um, the number is somewhere between 400 and 500 BOs, which are created by, by S1. And these BOs, if they are C1 release, are the right way to go in the other cloud. But we will come to the BO um, um, thing later. So maybe therefore, Volker, if, if it's okay, then we proceed maybe with a short, short summary. We take just one slide from the previous session as a, as a warm up to come into this transactional topic. And then we will go into detail about these trans transactional aspects. So we have explained in the other session how in a classic ALV, we can implement two buttons like accept and reject I think it were travel um, bookings, right? So we were able to, to reject and accept the bookings. And then you have these um, user commands um, where you can react then in a case statement and, and call your, your application code. <clears throat> and uh, still this application is based on these DLIC artifacts, on these um, very basic model-driven architecture, where you have then a lot of other code using that. And now in the Furilis report, and we are do, do using the same, so the same authority object, the same data uh, table, the same data elements can be used. And if you're referring to SAP content, of course, it needs to be released. Otherwise, you can't use it. And then you create your, your, your business object on top. Yeah? So first of all, a CDS view. You can have CDS views without a business object, a business object like the sales order, like the product, like a cinema, um, or like a travel or booking. And um, the, the CDS view, and that does then have this DCL. So you can see there are arrows between um, the CDS view, the DCL, and the authority object. That means, like I said, consuming a CDS view always implies applying the DCL. That means checking the authority object, but on a database level, which is way faster than doing it in a, in a single instance way um, in the above after loading the data, which doesn't work with, um, with, with paging, for example. And then um, having the CDS view would be enough in a, a read-only case, or if you create if you create a BO with many CDS views in a hierarchical way, in a composition, then we create a BDEF behavior definition for that. 
And um, because we need to do this service specifically, UI specifically, we have a projection or a consumption layer on top, which say, uh, which explain us um, which parts of the BO, which fields of the CDS view, which actions of the, the behavior definition should be part of this certain application, because um, typically there are multiple applications running on the same BO, or maybe different OData data services, or web APIs and all that stuff. So we can have you know, a specific projection on top. And then we include that in uh, the service definition and service binding. And we are trying to bring the service binding more to, to a comparison to the, to the classic report, and uh, not how it is implemented, but what you can do with that. So um, we um, delivered, I think, uh, or will in, in future deliver the, the feature that you can press F8 on a, on a service binding for a Fury application. And then immediately we will see the Fury elements preview. The preview is there for a long time, but that you also can press F8 like on the report to execute it as a developer, not as an end user, but as a developer locally in the system. Um, and and um, that we have the same same uh, same level here compared to Ruby. So, and here also we follow this model driven approach. So we have less ABAP code, but we also have more artifacts, obviously. And um, the behavior definition, as I said, represents the VO. Um, and uh, here, following this model driven approach, you have implementation hooks, how you can implement then, for example, actions which are implemented in such a PDF. We will see a complete business object in a minute when Proper will give us some, some insights. But in the BDEF, you can then model the action. And in the ABAP implementation, you have then typed APIs and these signatures of accept travel and reject travel derived of this action uh, definition. These um, are then implementation hooks, which where you can implement the, 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 uh, these um, actions by referring to this already from ABAP's uh, perspective, from the kernel perspective, provided API fully typed with integrated value um, element info, which is provided without doing any additional stuff from your side. And if we are talking about the O's, we um, do not want to support or to, to provide them, to, to implement them so that we can use them, for example, in Ethereum. But there's also a way to consume them in an ABAP way. So the question just was, how can I fill content into a database table? The answer was, please use the business objects and if you're using the business objects, then um, the ENL, the entity manipulation language, is the right way to do that. You can see here, for example, modify entities of travel, execute, reject travel, and then um, we execute the reject travel action for the given instance via the travel UUID, via the key. And then we get the um, feedback if the call was successful or if it failed. And we get back um, 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 yeah, end user messages like warnings, um, information, or errors via the reported um, statement or reported aspect of the email statement. Yeah, so that means a BO has this CDS view, this ECL. We have the behavior definition for um, CDS view for data modeling, behavior definition for um, transactional behavior modeling, and then ABAP, of course, for the implementation, which is then the the, the majority of the world, of course. And um, now, today, we, of course, want to go further into this aspect. So that was a simple ALB with two actions and how we could integrate that um, in, in the last session. Now we really go into detail. We will consider authorization checks. We will consider feature control, like how do I freeze certain fields so that they are read-only? How can I enable disabled actions? Logs, yeah? how, to, um, do, um, how to handle thank you logs. What about the messages? We saw it partially already with report and failed. And what about the OK codes in, in, a, uh, in a more complex query application? And of course, what about the SAP, LOW, and the update tasks? So we do not reinvent the wheel. We just um, provide more guidance, more best practices, how to support the SAP, LOW, how to um, integrate your update task or direct database updates in the in safe place. And all that. That is um, now in ABAP Cloud, handled via the ABAP RESTful application programming model and the so-called business objects. So business objects are essential if we are talking about transactional applications, at least if we are talking about UI and, and all data web APIs scenarios. So um, therefore, question goes to Volker. Volker, could you provide us some insights to this business object? I can try to, of course. Yeah. So thank you, Marcel, and then also again. 
hello everybody from my side. Um, by the way, there is um, a number of questions um, it's in the chat, so um, also maybe Marcel can um, in parallel have a look at it. Um, and one additional one was um, how um, um, functions can be accessed um, from the cloud, like um, remote function calls. Um, those can also be consumed from a um, BDP environment, for instance. So there's options, of course, to also um, perform, let me share my screen. Um, there's also the option to perform such calls across system component, uh, across um, system boundaries, yeah. But yeah, so what is, um, am I supposed to show now in the beginning? Um, that is the, um, yeah, to, to show you a bit, um, give you short, short insights into the um, our development tools in Eclipse. There's also one of the other question, I think regarding grouping and so on in the chat. So also maybe I can take uh, and pick this one up. So first of all, um, yeah, as Marcel mentioned, we will um, use um, um, a RAP business object in today's um, session um, for demo purposes. It is a, a so-called unmanaged uh, business object for those of you that have already um, worked with um, RAP BOs. Um, and yeah, what is a business object about? So we had it um, discussed, um, or Marcel mentioned it several times. Um, it starts, of course, at the very beginning. The database table is the source, of course, of all the data and the actual, uh, yeah, the facts, um, and then based on that, we define the um, data model in CDS. There was also a question regarding more complex things might not be can yeah can maybe not be modeled um, using the CDS capabilities. Um, but for these purposes, especially when it comes to um, um, uh, providing um, queries and um, the data for Fiori UIs, you can also make use of the so-called unmanaged query in which you can implement the um, yeah data retrieval yourself. Um, with the pros and cons, of course, you do it then in ABAP, which is always not the recommended approach in terms of performance. So therefore, we um, the, the recommendation here is definitely to somehow try to um, use the um, query push down to the HANA database to make uh, best usage of the HANA performance. Yeah. And, and I think uh, CDS is, is very, very powerful. So yeah. I think uh, most of the content or nearly all content from s is modeled as a virtual data model. You might have heard that. So that means all the different database tables cleaned up or the data which which requires unions because it's basically the same data just maybe wrongly modeled 20, 30 years ago is represented here. And, and there we have uh, certain different layers of in the application space and, and that is very, very powerful. And you can even create CDS views which I use as multidimensional reporting applications where we have uh, cubes and dimensions and all that stuff. So CDS this is very, very powerful. And if CDS is not powerful, like uh, for Volker said, you can use the above exit, or maybe even better, and there are also NDPs, above managed database procedures, where you can have a more nearly um, unanimated. Exactly. So, but back to the business object as such. Um, so, the business object is basically comprised of three uh, kind of base elements. The first one is the, um, the, the structure and the data model itself. As said, we model this as data definition, CDS. Uh, um, um, views. And um, here, as an example, we see that um, using our travel um, um, reference scenario where we have a, um, a business object that consists of three nodes. So that's uh, what we call a composition hierarchy. It uh, starts on the on the very um, um, yeah, on, the, on the root level. That's also indicated by a certain uh, by the dedicated keyword here. Um, it starts on the travel node, which is kind of the bracket around a travel, yeah, um, which you can assume. And then um, it has a one-to-many uh, relationship to the bookings. And underneath the bookings, you can even have booking supplements, but we will leave that out in today's session. So just uh, we focus on the two nodes here. Um, but yeah, this is um, the structure which is defined. Um, um, this is the so-called model. Uh, there you specify the kind of yeah, developer-friendly names. It's also possible when you, when you define the fields and the properties or the elements, how we call them, um, to uh, use camel casing, yeah, so you don't need to rely on the underscoring and uh, what the database provides, but you can um, also yeah, make use of the camel casing and have nicer names there. So that's the first aspect, the data, data model and the composition hierarchy. Um, the second aspect when it becomes, uh, when it comes about um, a business object is the behavior um, that is um, um, specified in a dedicated artifact, the so-called behavior definition. Yeah, um, in the past, in the former programming model, um, this was handled via annotations in the CDS views, but um, we, we learned that um, it is more optimal if a dedicated artifact is um, um, taking care of it. And um, the behavior definition is shown here. It's a set, it's an unmanaged implementation in this particular case. And as the name indicates, it defines and specifies the behavior. So we have various things here. 
Um, we specify an, uh, an entity tag, which is um, important for the OData exposure. We specify that this instance, this entity here, um, which is specified first, is a so-called log master. We specify how the author, um, authorizations are implemented on which level, global and or on instance level and so on. Also, the numbering can be specified, early numbering, late numbering and so on. Um, um, that's the second aspect. And the third aspect is the actual implementation that's um, um, specified here um, by naming the um, class. So it's a um, kind of technically it's a regular um, um, class with a little specifics here and it's also nicely implemented here or kind of nested here in the uh, navigation uh, in the project explorer so that you can find that and um, the implementation um, basically implements then the certain exits that are needed here. Yeah? So we can just jump in for instance the log handling as an example. Marcel mentioned this also in the introduction um, how the log is being implemented and this is how the log is implemented in ARPO. What's also important about RDT and the tools, because there's plenty of them integrated. For instance, we have a so-called um, relation explorer. Um, whenever you want to add a um, or open a, a view, which is not there by default, you can do that um, by um, 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 adding um, another view here. So you can show view and then select the one you want to um, um, add. Um, so the rel relation explorer can be opened and it shows um, basically the relation and the, um, the connection between all the um, related artifacts. Yeah. So for instance, you can um, um, turn this into the business object view mode, and then you see the BO relevant artifacts. Yeah. And here you see it, it recognizes that this is a, a root CDS view out of that uh, travel BO, and it's nicely showing here the structure of the composition hierarchy, not all the associations, but the composition hierarchy, and it could directly navigate into it. Now, I can also use so-called forward navigation. You know that from the good old GUI times where you would uh, do double click. That is, in this case, control click. And for instance, I could, um, via that, jump and di directly navigate into the underlying database table. That is the source of this CDX view. Um, also very important to mention is the so-called element info. So you have uh, built-in tooling support. If I press the F2 button, then you see the element info opens and uh, the element info shows you at hand um, based on the corresponding artifact that is that is highlighted here. Um, um, information about the structure. In this case, I see the definition of the um, CDS view uh, with all the fields that are being exposed, the composition hierarchy, the associations, and you see there are links where so I can even drill down further here and uh, navigate further into it. And I think with that, also given the fact that we about might run out of time, I will hand back to Marcel, right? Okay, right. Thank, thank you. Let me quickly unshare and I can take it out. Thank you so much, Volker. So um, what we will do now is um, after um, understanding the business object that it has um, CDS views, it has the behavior definition, it has other implementation can be viewed in, in this relation explorer, the BO viewer. Now the, the, the thing that we want to do is we want to, um, like we did it also in the, in the last um, session um, with the LB and the Fury app, we do it here also. We show you how you do or how we do things in the classic ABAP report. Then we will have a look on the ABAP report where we also can use a rep BO, which is interesting. And then we will see also the Fury application is um, based on this rep BO, which is of course much easier once you have this BO because um, the Fury application of Fury elements can use all this model driven things, which is of course not known to the ABAP reports uh, where we need to do that again manually. But um, using, um, um, and therefore we will have a look on the end user perspective. We will check what need I need, need I uh, to do in the classic ABAP implementation, the ABAP report, and then with the uh, business object, we will see how this is um, in, uh, integrated into the Fury app, but also how to consume that within the ABAP report. So the business object is centrally uh, is, is defined once centrally as a reuse um, artifact. We implement here everything, and then I still can via the EML, the entity manipulation language, which we just saw at the beginning. And we can use that also within an ABAP report because if you want to modernize your code or if you say, well, tomorrow I start at least using these new things, then of course you have still um, old applications, still your existing applications, and then also the combination should run. And therefore, as, as a side track, we also show here how this rep BO can even be used in an ABAP report. Um, it's not only stateless, it can also work stateful, but it's optimized for stateless. So, and then, um, the next um, thing would be to have Volker again to explain us shortly the three different application types. And maybe, Volker, what about authorizations? <laughs> okay, thank you, Marcel. What a nice handover. 
So yeah, let me share my screen again. Um, yeah, as said and as uh, introduced by Marcel, we uh, will have these three aspects or these three types of applications today. Two of them are Lympro apps, and um, the third one is then the Fury app. And um, they are based on the identical data model and the data source, so the underlying um, logic is um, the same. Um, however, they are exposed differently. As I said, two of them are exposed as uh, Lutros. And we start with the um, RUI-based application, and we have the classic one that is um, not using up at all. It is directly accessing um, the database or is also accessing the um, 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 corresponding um, BAPIs and RFC function modules in order to make use of the business logic. And yeah, it's a, it's a regular DIMPO application. I can quickly um, oops, show it to you and start it here from the ADT. Um, and this one goes in this way that it, yeah, it's again about the travel application as I, sh uh, as I showed you in the uh, demo before with the CDS view. It's about travels. Yeah, you can select the travel from the list. Yeah, you can just pick number four. I think that's the one that we prepared for the for the demo. Um, you could also create a new one. You can delete it and you can display it. And inside the session, um, inside the transaction on the second screen, you can then edit it, change the attributes. Um, we have an action here that is setting the status to booked. And um, based on that, um, we also have certain um, kind of yeah uh, things that then are turned off. For instance, if I set the status to booked then um, the button itself is disabled because once it is set to booked, the travel status, then it's not editable anymore. I can revert it back if I want, and then the button goes on again. Yeah, so this is the classic um, um, yeah, DIMPO implementation. And um, for instance, uh, we can just yeah, have a look as an, uh, um, um, as an example into the um, 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 handling here, for instance, the user command handling here, um, and the OK code handling, I can just um, step into the one and there you see the typical case OK code and then all the traditional stuff is happening. Yeah? So very similar um, works the, let me quickly close this, uh, very similar works the um, um, BO based DIMPO application. So if I start this one, it looks um, identical. You will not notice any difference here because I um, implemented it in the exact same way. So same thing here, you can just edit and so on. That all works the same way as before. But what is different here, the handling um, as such. Yeah? That means um, the data is not retrieved directly by calling any BAPIs or maybe doing any database access on the database tables directly. But instead, we are making use of the entity manipulation language. Yeah? So this is a GUI, just to repeat that, the GUI trans, uh, transaction that is making use of the RAP business object. And um, by we do that um, in the way that we uh, make use of the entity manipulation language to um, interact with the RAP business object. And that, for instance, is being done in the in the sense, uh, for instance, when it when it comes to the um, locking, when we need to um, prepare the uh, screen output and the um, uh, turn on buttons on and off, um, that is um, um, handled here, for instance, in the PBO. And there we make use of one of the ML statements, which is called called get permissions. Yeah, that that is accessing the RAP business object. It is yeah referring to the RAP business object, and we ask the business object for the authorizations of of it, and um, then we get a result, and the result tells us if the authorization is granted, and based on that we can then turn certain buttons on or off. Yeah. So just as a very quick example, I've prepared a different user which I'm logged in with who does not have the change authorization. And here the same thing applies. So if I start the transaction, it doesn't matter which one I start, I could start the classic one or the up based one, then the button is turned off because the user does not have the corresponding authorization. And of course, in the up based BO, the same holds true here as well. Yeah, so traditional um, authorization handling as, as you know it. And of course, um, the third element here um, is then the um, purely based application and the same holds true here as well. Uh, I need to open that screen, so here it is. Um, here we have the same capabilities. It's fully transactionally enabled. Let's also pick number four as an example here. Um, I'm logged in with my user, so therefore the edit button is on, but the same uh, would appear. Do I have it open already? No, I don't have it. Uh, open quickly in your incognito window. And there, then you see that um, with the other user, I think it is still using that one. Yeah, exactly. You see that um, test user that I have here does not have the added authorization, so it's not allowed to update any records, and therefore cannot make use of this button. So um, again, um, so we have um, the central RAP business object that is being used for um, the um, um, RAP BO based um, GUI transaction, DIMPO transaction, as well as um, using uh, used as a source 
for the um, Fury application. And um, on the upside, we jump back into the RDT. On the RPO side, we can um, jump into the authorization handling here as well. So therefore, just a very short recap about what I mentioned before. So the authorization master defines the authorizations to be handled on global uh, level as well as on instance level. What does that basically mean? Global means that you can specify on a global level um, that, um, for instance, an update or uh, a delete operation is not allowed at all. And then, of course, you don't need to look into the instance specific ones if the same is being requested. Yeah, so sometimes in case it could happen that it's on a global level already specified and therefore you do not need to jump, uh, look into the instance. However, um, instance ones come into play, of course, if it is yeah, instance specific and therefore certain um, um, business data is uh, relevant and, and need to decide if the authorization is granted. So very quickly, then I will hand back to Marcel. Um, in that global exit, and this is um, this uh, behavior um, um, implementation that I, that I showed before. So um, all the things that you specify in the behavior definition will then, um, some of them, not all of them, uh, some of them will um, um, offer then certain exits to be implemented only in case an exit is needed or an implementation is required. And um, this, for instance, is, is the, say, the case for the global authorization exit. And here we basically calculate if the grade, the update, and so on authorization is there. And of course, inside the RAPIO implementation, of course, the traditional logic again is implemented here. The authority check, then the one that you know, um, is also being executed here because of, yeah, that's the way how authorizations are being checked. And with that, I hand it over back to Musa. Thank you so much, Volker. We had. Um several questions in the chat, and more or less also always related to, to the data model, to CDS. So let's maybe go on to that uh, maybe shortly. So the question was, why should I model such a CDS view if I'm using um, in a Hubbard report a select statement with some joins? So of course, if you are re building a report, then you can do that in the Hubbard, um, I'm doing that in this, this Hubbard code with uh, Hubbard SQL to create the joins there. But even here, it might be better to use a CDS view because you can execute the CDS view in a data preview, for example. You can test the CDS view individually without having that integrated into your, your other code, how to test it there. You can attach the DCL. You don't have to remember to keep um, for, for other usages. If there's just one, maybe it's, it's overhead. But if there's maybe in future two or three, you could then use the authority object directly um, attached by the DCL. So that was one question. The other question was, um, what about data in the cloud? Um, it's not about database tables, which are um, um, yeah, um, wrapped via CDS views or business objects. Um, when in the real cloud, we, we need to access data externally, system externally. Uh, yeah, it depends. Of course, uh, we have both. So if we are talking about an ERP um, a cloud solution like Aswana, by the public cloud on premise, there of course a lot of data is locally in the system, and then we need to learn how to access that, and that's what we are today talking about. What we are not going to talk about today, but which is also part of our cloud, yeah, and which is also integrated or uh, described how to integrate it into REP business objects, is um, uh, data integration and and how to transfer data from A to B, um, and still following the principle of of the ACID paradigm or the SAP LOW, which is similar. The approach um, and and just a different word and um, yeah so how how to make uh, that sure this is very interesting we could talk about that for hours because we thought about that a lot of uh, a lot, a lot very long time now how we can achieve same qualities for for integration services and by using asynchronous communication um, which is required here but uh, that's not part of this scenario here if you're building microservices probably more important to you this integration stuff. But um, if we are talking about the ERP space, about the uh, Aswana, then um, it's more the local business. It always depends where you are. Nothing is wrong, everything is right, but just different scenario. So, but now, moving forward. Um, so, click, click. Not working. My slides are not working anymore. Now they are working. Okay. So, okay. Um, authorizations. We just saw it from Volker, uh, Volker's demo. Thank you to Volker for that. So, in the classic ABAP report, we just want to make sure that the edit button is uh, not reflected, and we do that via the authority check, of course, and um, yeah, provide the feedback then to the Drupal application. If you are using a RepBO, then first we need this RepBO to achieve the same. 
So we define it once centrally, like I argued with the CDSU. If you have it once, you can, can execute that, you can test it individually, and you can reuse it everywhere. So even without having this model-driven approach with Fury, it is interesting to do that because here you can say, I have a BO travel, and it has an authority check. And this authorization check is done always internally. So and there we could then um, uh, um, fill all the details which are required if the authorization is there or not, if has provided that. And of course, also here we do the authority check. It requires here some code, yes, a little bit more maybe than here, but it's 100% reusable and always um, 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 checked if it is required on the premises. And then um, how can I consume that in, a, in the um, ABAP report? We have the EML statement, get permissions. Yeah, and get permissions returns feature control and authorizations. If you want to have just authorizations, you can also call it like that. And then you will get back the feedback for um, um, update and delete, whatever is requested in the result. And it's a fully typed API, which looks always the same for all business objects. You can ask, uh, can, can call that. Of course, in Fury, we don't need to call that to make the edit disabled if I don't have the permission because we are following here the model-driven approach. Rep or our cloud in general will forward this information to Fury Elements via OData, and then OData will make sure that the edit button is disabled, first of all. And secondly, at runtime, when there is, and, and someone tries to do the edit, maybe you're not doing that via Fury UI, but differently via the OData, you know, the trick, do some tricks here, then uh, still we check it, of course, and make sure that nothing goes wrong for each update. And uh, we do that basically also for um, the feature control. So we do the same here. If I want to have set booked disabled, then um, we can do that um, via, via the classic handling in, in, in our report. And if I want to do that via RepBO, then after I modeled the action set status booked, I can provide the um, feature instance besides the authorization, also the feature control and implement that and, for example, reacting to that if something is already booked, then um, you cannot um, press the set status booked button again. And of course, also here, we can get this uh, via get permissions, only feature instance for the set status booked action, and then um, provide this for, my, for, for the intro um, applications in the case. And in a Fury application, again, because it's a model-driven approach, we handle that automatically. There is no glue code required. We just provide it for all inherited fields and operations via these, this projection layer, which I just mentioned. And if we go now to logs, we call the NQ API, the NQ function module in the classic ABAP and provide them the message. And we can achieve the same in an ABAP report using a RepBO once a RepBO is provided. And um, here we would have a RepBO with a log master. The log master says, well, I'm providing or I'm, I'm, I'm for my node, you can lock the instances and all sub nodes, which are dependents, um, um, inherit this. And, and then um, again, the log master is locked. If, if an item in sales orders, for example, is changed, then we lock also this complete sales order. Um, and maybe we will, or we have already introduced in the cloud, um, lock dependence on the new uh, lock masters on sub node that you can even lock on an item level um, because you want to have um, um, parallel changes running in an in a application job or a pure application. Order. And um, yeah, and for that, we saw already, I think, also the implementation calling the, the um, lock API and um, providing the details in, in the unmanaged implementation. By the way, Volker said we are, of course, using an unmanaged BO here. Unmanaged BO is used for, for if you want to integrate legacy code, which of, is, of course, the case here. We have the code running in the ABAP report in a reusable way, and we integrate that via these um, APIs and into our unmanaged BO. We will see later what are the alternatives. And here, in this ABAP report, we can call again the entity manipulation language, and this time, with a new statement set logs set logs of travel and then um, we provide the travel id to in order to to um, block the instance in fury or in uh, odata um, integration um, uh, in general this is not required we do this automatically following the model driven approach there is no blue code required 
So, and then uh, the next demo um, will um, consider create, update, delete, and actions. Exactly. Thank you, Marcel. So maybe we pick quickly one or the other question. We don't have too much time left, so I need to speed up, I think, a little bit. So one question or the recent one is uh, regarding um, sorry, quickly share already. Uh, regarding um, um, what if you are not using Fiori um, elements as a as a consumer, a Fiori app. This, of course, works um, as well. So from a backend perspective, we are more or less agnostic about the consumer as such. However, Fiori elements is um, kind of first class citizen what we what we consider here. So that means all the um, annotations that you specify in CDS level, for instance, and also the um, the uh, UI hints and the ones that decide whether a button is on or off. Um, they uh, follow the kind of yeah the um, certain annotations that are specified in your data protocol. So, for instance, UI annotations and a, and a corresponding vocabulary. And Fiori Elements is making use of that. But of course, any other OData consumer can also um, um, yeah consume this service and uh, make use of that and render the UI accordingly. So there is no need to make use of Fiori Elements. Um, but of course, since um, all our S4 apps or most of our S4 apps are built in Fiori Elements, that's um, what we propose as a as consuming um, UI. So yeah, great. Update and delete. Um, so very quickly, as said, um, as we don't have too much time left. Um, so first of all, my connection seems to be broken. No, it's not. It's not broken. It's still there. Um, so the um, implementation um, from the um, RAP business point of view is simply done by specifying the uh, create, update, delete keywords. And um, correspondingly, since um, it's it's uh, integration of legacy code, what we simulate here with this business object, which is also, by the way, um, explained in our um, um, reference documentation, that's it also being shipped as a, a reference example, um, not the one that I adjusted here for the demo, but the, the traditional one, the standard one that we offer here to explain the programming model. Um, and there you see that, for instance, in the update implementation, there is um, yeah, the corresponding BAPI being, being called to simulate how uh, a legacy application is being um, integrated here. And um, the same is done also in the traditional uh, GUI application. So let me quickly exit all these screens here so to make this a bit more, um, give, give more overview here. So um, if we, for instance, um, look into the um, um, process, the OK code, Ending that we saw before. Um, there we see that, for instance, um, the um, um, handling here also of an action is um, done in the way that um, it's delegated to a, to a um, sub method here. And then, um, so this is the modify one. Sorry, this is the, the RAP BO. Um, I mixed this up. I wanted to show the classic BO, um, which is located here. And there we have the user command on 300, and there's the OK code handling. So you see that's a bit more. Clicking that, for instance, um, the set status booked form routine is then also calling this leg legacy logic, this so called yeah, BAPI, uh, that we simulate here in order to set this status. So, this is um, how this is being integrated. And very nice feature that you have when it comes um, to the, to the um, uh, using the Fury application and the Fury app preview, that uh, what we also make use here. So, it's not a deployed application. But we just make use of the preview, which is quite easy um, because it is uh, right away available um, as um, um, when you when you do the service exposure in a, um, for UI specific um, service, and then you can make use of the Fiori elements at preview. And um, you can um, make use of the so-called ABAP cross trace in order to see what is basically happening inside the stack and in which um, uh, things are being called at what point in time. This is again a tool that you can open here by um, opening the corresponding view, make this a little bigger. Um, and um, you can make use of this cross trace um, in the way that you um, specify a, a trace configuration. And um, the name is uh, given by default in the sense that um, it is uh, doing a trace cross component. So all the components that are involved in a, um, in a RAP transaction are being called or not, actually not bound to RAP as such, but um, um, all the components that contribute to the cross trace are shown here. And uh, typically, you can just leave the default settings and just um, um, activate the trace. So it's now being activated. You see that here. And if I now jump into the um, GUI, uh, sorry, the Fiori application, perform a change like saying vacation one, two, three, and storing this information, then if everything goes well, um, this call has been captured. I will deactivate the trace, go to the trace results, a little refresh, refresh because I tried to yesterday as well and we see here that's the one because i think it has 
fetched another token. That should be the one that I'm looking for. And now we have a, a, a full end-to-end -end trace about the entire um, um, all the um, components that are being used for handling this update request from the Fiori UI. So you see here also that the global authorization exit is being called, the lock is being called, and um, further down that the corresponding update um, is being called. Um, why am I showing this to you? Because the cross trace is a very useful and helpful feature in order to also troubleshoot certain things that might not, uh, so if things are not going as expected. And all these blue ones indicate already that these are hyperlinks. So if I use the control um, a key on my, my keyboard and click inside, then you see I'm directly navigated to the same update call that I showed you before. So I see exactly in the RPO where the corresponding handling is, is uh, taking place and um, yeah, uh, uh, how the um, corresponding BAPI function module is being called. And I could, of course, now set a breakpoint to that operation again, just in case something is not working as expected. Yeah, so the cost trace gives you a very good overview about what is happening inside the stack. And I think given the fact that we are a little short on time, I will then hand back to Marcel, I guess, right? Yeah, Volker, great uh, demo. Thank you so much. So um, um, we, we just saw um, one, one of the CRUD operations. So here with um, the change, we um, implement that, of course, in the other report. But um, as Volker has shown uh, us, we can also then um, define the create, update, and delete in the behavior definition and implement that in the update um, API, which is, again, a predefined API where we can call in our legacy code or application code, or um, we do it differently, as we see in a, in a second. And uh, once we have that, we can, of course, also call that in our other report. And um, yeah, as you can see, the um, orchestration here is um, sometimes um, yeah, challenging. Maybe everyone knows how to do that. I'm not 100% sure. Um, you know, Volker, for example, I'm sorry, Volker, to, to, to say that. Um, two days ago, Volker had a small, small bug. Um, he did the NQ after um, the authority check or, or after reading the data. And therefore, I added the box which implementation is correct to ask you as the audience which one is correct. So, but Volker fixed now the bug, updated the screenshots. So unfortunately, now it looks exactly the same, but you get the point. Um, the runtime orchestration for logs, authorization, instance, global, maybe e-tech, if you are talking about stateless, and all that stuff, that's quite complex. And, and if you do, for example, the um, NQ too early, then it's wrong. Maybe you missed the authorization before that. And, and um, so you can, if you, whenever you change the right orchestration, it is wrong, and therefore we have um, with a lot of um, feedback from the application side, and and especially from from Renzo Colle, he's really a pro in, in in several topics, especially also on the transactional topic. Um, we we came to this um, orchestration to first do the global authorization, global feature control. So if you're not allowed to do anything, then um, we don't need to proceed, and um, then we lock the data before we actually read and evaluate the data. And that's also, for example, important for the e-tech. So if you compare the e-tech before locking the data, then it might have changed after you compared it and before you set the log. So therefore, this is the only reasonable orchestration. And we make sure that this orchestration is done in all RepBOs, independent who built the RepBO in which point in time. So and the same um, for actions. We can also call and implement actions here. We saw that um, in the, uh, some, some, some demos here from Volker, the action definition, the action implementation. And we can also call the action, of course, via modified entities. And in Fury, we can expose that. We don't have the syntax here. But what you need to do is um, you need to consider the action then in your projection, like use action set status booked. And um, also consider the UI annotation in order to tell Fury elements how to render it, what is the label, and, and uh, several information. So now um, with the interaction phase um, and um, the save sequence, I think um, we talked about the interaction phase. We didn't call it like that. So create, update, delete, and action are part of the interaction phase. We in rep do the central orchestration of all that stuff. And we do that not only for one business object, but there might also be multiple business objects involved in one um, in one request. So if we have, for example, the sales order, the attachments and nodes, and maybe more, then um, of course, or there are multiple business objects being involved and there could be a very complex call via 
by a web API um, from, from a from, from, from a cyber side extensibility use case. And of course, we need to make sure that everything is done in the right order for all business objects, not in parallel, but theoretically in parallel, because we do not um, we, but we do it in a stepwise approach for all business objects. And um, the save sequence is similar. So if I press the save button, um, then we do the central organization of, of this. And um, yeah, we um, perform then also the same stuff. So we consider, for example, the latest changes that need to be done. So maybe some determinations of values triggering some something is very important um, and and uh, but also very time consuming. Therefore, we don't do it um, in the modify step, but we want to do that shortly before we save the data. And then once every business object did the last changes, nobody's allowed to do any changes anymore, at least not in RepiO. And then we ask every business object for the last and final um, to check the last uh, time for, for errors. Maybe it was related to some changes which were now done in the different business object. And if everything goes well, then we come to the point of no return. We draw the late numbers and then actually the data is persisted. We trigger the events, asynchronous handling, and finally perform the commit. So that was one, precisely one commit on the database. Everything is done, and there are no implicit database commits in between so that something goes wrong, that events are triggered, workflows are triggered before persisting the data or even without persisting the data. So we make sure that this works in rep, but also um, Guru mentioned that shortly in the keynote via this um, CL other tricks, save handler. So we also have this um, interaction and save or modify and save because there um, so are steps also outside of rep to apply that in local events, in BGPF, the background processing framework, or wherever you want, even Newton application can be done. And now, if we have a look on the update task um, and um, how to do that, we see here that um, Volker um, um, has done this in this classic uh, report via call function, um, travel save, and then we trigger the commit work and wait. Um, of course, we could do the same also after we have the RepBO, and in the RepBO, we would then um, call the same function module in the so-called save hook. So rep provides here again this method, which you can implement, and then you can um, save the data and um, integrate that via the um, commit entities statement. So commit entities and commit work is basically triggering the same. It's, we, we can also replace the commit work by commit entities or the other way around. The commit entities has just more options because it's a modern version of commit work. And these more options are related to rep or to the ABAP, um, to the um, more modeled uh, sub LOW approach. For example, you can convert keys which are drawn as late numbers, and um, because you might be interested in that. And this is, of course, done also uh, required for the UI. You want to show the new keys, not the ones which were provided by the by the end user, or they were initial at the beginning but really provide the keys to the UI. Therefore, we need to convert the keys here in this uh, report. And of course, also this is done, um, besides other things, this is also done by rep um, in, in the orchestration with query elements. And um, yeah, so um, there are two things which you should know. Maybe we can then have one or two more questions shortly. So the first thing is that we have um, three RepBO implementation types, basically two. So one is unmanaged, you have your existing application code. You modeled it like Guru did in this in the in the for the sales order in, in the in the keynote. You modeled it in, in, a, in a separate API, which you can use in Dynpro and, and Web Dynpro ABAP and SOAP and whatever. You can now integrate that also into RepBO. And then we have this this uh, last final facet, which can be used everywhere, and we take over the technical aspects, protocol aspects, and things like that. So you integrate your legacy code. Second uh, approach is a managed way. You can um, just say I want to have CRUD support and everything works out of the box and you can then fine tune via determinations, validations, actions, the, the, the business logic of the BO, but the, the main aspects are considered then also from the framework. And you could still here also reuse existing update task function modules, existing logs, um, authorization objects, of course, and all that stuff. Um, but the actual CRUD and uh, buffer handling is done by us. 
but um, several breakouts are available to integrate your code. If you have, for example, like I would say spaghetti code in your Dunpro PBO PAI uh, thing, then you and you don't want to re rework all on that and, and, and integrate it then in REP, doesn't make sense. You can really then start from the scratch in REP and reuse your database table and, and all the other stuff. And the second thing is we didn't consider the draft. Yeah. So, but why is the draft important? Because our cloud is a development model for cloud ready apps. Cloud ready implies stateless. So that means we have basically transactional applications, but the applications which are um, um, stateful need to be um, processed by a stateless protocol. So stateless applications on a stateless protocol. And therefore, what we are doing with the draft concept is to keep the logs, the NQ logs, together with the data more or less persisted between the different round trips which are going from Fury Elements or from Fury to the other backend. And therefore, we don't need to keep an ABAP session open all the time. And we are doing it not, um, but um, that we persist the things which are required. And if there comes a new request, then we start again with the ABAP session. So for both, you find here um, um, documentation. It's not pretty new, but it's pretty good. Um, it's just um, these are the concepts which are pretty old, several years, so not, not a completely new innovation. But um, yeah, just the basics for IPOs. And having that as a summary, um, is that uh, our cloud and also REP define the architecture blueprint. Yeah? So it tells you which um, technologies are there, which ones we should use. Um, it is required to be cloud ready, especially for transaction apps with REP, but our cloud contains much more. And um, here we achieve all the, the qualities which we need to achieve in the cloud. And of course, we um, have a better investment from application side, from, from implementation side, because um, we have less technical coding. If you like it, you can do so. But sometimes, I don't know, implementing an OData service, we had also the question with Gateway. If you want to have an OData service which works in all different scenarios, it's a hard job. And um, like Guru also explained, doing that more from a technical side and having a broad coverage for all services it's, a, I think, from my perspective, a better investment than, than investing on application side of the time into these technical aspects and what happens in Gateway if I do that and then all get out of that. So here you can use uh, invest on the BO side and the technical integration can be done by experts working on that um, for 10 years. Then. So and therefore, to sum this, uh, sum this up, our cloud is a development model and it manifests our SAP's best practices, not only from technology side, but also from application side, because we are closely collaborating with the partners. So that was it from our side. Um, for more information can be found via the links provided here. You can maybe have a look afterwards, documentation, community side, roadmap. But having said that, um, we are through with our slides and demos. Um, do we have maybe one, two more questions we want to go into? Yeah, of course. Um, a number of additional questions. Um, let me pick the last one that I saw. Um, uh, I'd still, I seem to be a follow up question. I'd still like to get better handle on whether or not there's anything we should request our developers to use with cloud in mind when creating new objects now in NetWeaver 750. Or is this rather a smooth and wasted effort? Um, yeah, I think it is, uh, makes a lot of sense to to consider that as, as soon as possible. I mean, of course, at that point in time, you don't have any released APIs or something like that that you can um, um, base your coding on. But however, you can structure it in a way that um, depending on what you implement and, and how, how many um, SAP um, artifacts you are using, um, it would be a good practice to um, reduce this in a way and to um, encapsulate the access to the SAP objects because this also then fits this uh, tier one, two and three approach that we are uh, proposing for the on-premise um, and the uh, private cloud edition world, in which, uh, of course, there is certain scenarios where you simply cannot just just only make use of released artifacts, but you have to use something um, that is not released. And this is then a uh, kind of yeah, a capture uh, encapsulated in a tier two approach, which means you uh, implement a little wrapper where you do this unallowed access, and, and this wrapper is then released to the others. And you could already start building this wrapper now so that the number of accesses is reduced to only these little number of wrappers. And then later on, when, when you move to cloud, um, that then can also be um, yeah, released in the sense that um, um, all the other uh, um, um, components in your uh, solution then only access this uh, prepared wrapper and uh, you don't start there entirely from scratch.
Exactly. So using ADT and uh, CDS on also on lower releases, I think that's um, yeah, that definitely is. a good idea. And um, even if it's outside of our cloud, because it's not the other cloud language version um, our for cloud development, but still using these technologies is a good idea. Because if you wait for the next 2025 upgrade in I don't know how many years, then you have to learn everything in one point in time. And here we can maybe start slowly and focus on the really important stuff. I had also an interesting question, which I answered in the chat, but I think it's worth to repeat it as well. So the question was, what about a simple report use case where you have um, several input fields, you want to press a button, and then you want to see the results somewhere, but it's not like you have a data model, you select rows, you press an action, but it's more like you want to really execute a bar P with some input fields, but not really on a like a CDS model that doesn't work, and you release report that doesn't work in this pattern. And this easy, simple uh, report use case, which is often used in technical um, scenarios, but maybe also for end user scenarios, this is something we currently are investigating together with our query colleagues, how and um, if and how we want to support that, um, supporting we want, of course, but maybe not via Fury, I don't know, let's see. Um, um, but we are currently investigating how, how to do that and um, how to also integrate the application job for asynchronous execution and all these uh, things. But to be honest, we have a very broad coverage of new features or of features in general now with our cloud and rep. So um, it's, it's a mass adoption ready since quite a while. And as one is broadly using it, but of course we have also gaps because if we would not have gaps, we would not work on that anymore, which would be a pity. So therefore we have some gaps and one gap is this report use case. Another gap is the hierarchy preview support, which comes soon or is on the way. You saw it with 23.11 in the keynote. Integrating the unmanaged query with QDEV uh, query definition, that's also an, an, an currently not well done um, from our point of view where we need to improve. And there are probably more topics, but like I said, so more is coming and stay tuned. So there's a lot of um, ambitious people here working on these topics. So then, Volker, I would say seven minutes of our time, sorry for that. But um, yeah, <clears throat> we hope we provided a good transition for you to map your knowledge from the classic world into the new world. I need to drink some water now. Uh, thank you for joining the party and uh, see you soon. Thanks for attending the session. Have Thank a good you, Parker. Thank you. Day. Bye bye. Thank you, Marcel. Cheers, bye bye. Yeah, bye bye.